All right, Christ going forth to conquer. Revelation chapter 6 picks up where the Lamb, the Lamb of God, and as you know, that's none other than our Savior, Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lamb slain, who is worthy to open the book. And this is that seven-sealed book, remember, that, that book of the purpose and the plan of God. The opening of these seals is a revelation of truth. And it's a truth that only God reveals. And again, what he's showing us from the view of the throne of God the, in this second vision, that's what this, this is, is what, what it's going to be like during the last days. The days uh, from Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension up to his uh, second coming. And this is what it's going to be like. And that's what these seven seals reveal. And so let's look at it. Verse 1, he says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, this is the first seal, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. That's, thunder means power. Thunder represents the, the power of God, the authority of God. In other words, there's nothing above this. There's nothing that can stop this. This is the invincible authority. Man could not stop the power, authority, word, and providence of God no more than he can stop the thunder from sounding. And that's what this is. And in this noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, one of the four living creatures, these messengers, saying, come and see. So here is the command of the messengers of God in the four corners of the earth for every, every true believer, every child of God, every sinner saved by grace to look at this. Come and see this. Here's what, here's what it's going to be like. In verse 2, he starts off with the first seal. He said, I saw and behold a white horse. Now, you know, white in the scripture represents purity, holiness, sinlessness, righteousness. That's what white represents. It's, 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 the, uh, it's that which uh, symbolizes uh, Christ as the righteousness of his people. We'll see later on that the people of God, true believers, they wear white robes. Uh, back in the Old Testament, the priest garments, they were white linen. That was, and all that represents Christ's righteousness imputed to us, whereby we stand before God with a perfection that was given to us by a divine act of imputation so that we can say that God will not charge us with sin, well, here's Christ himself. I believe this represents Christ himself on this white horse. It says, and he that sat on him had a bow, like a bow and arrow, and a crown was given to him. Now, we'll talk about this bow in just a minute, but this crown is his mediatorial crown. Now, what I mean by that, you know, when we think about the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Think about the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. Now, as God, we used to say it this way, and it's, it's fine, as God absolutely considered, he has always had all authority and all power. He never lost that. But as God-man, which is his, uh, his person as the Savior of his people, he had to become a man. He had to... He had, the word had to be made flesh to dwell among, and dwell among us. He had to be made like unto his people, God's elect, given to him before the foundation of the world. He had to be like us in every way in, in his humanity without sin. So this is the crown of glory that's given to him on the basis and as the result of his doing the work that he was given to do to redeem us from our sins. So understand that, you know, somebody, uh, there, there used to be a, 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 a yeah, I'll say a minor controversy because there wasn't too many people involved in it, talking about, well, Christ wasn't Lord until he was raised from the dead. And people got all upset about that, thinking, well, now, wait a minute, he, he's God, the second person of the Trinity. And that's true, but you have to make a distinction here. You remember in John 17 when he prays, you know, uh, uh, he, he talked about the glory of, he said, give unto me the glory which I had with thee before the world began. In other words, he set aside that glory for a while 
in the person of his humanity. And it was hidden from view. And he had to do a work to earn that glory as God-man. And that's what it's talking about here. This crown was given to him. Now, why was it given to him? Because he's the king. Because he did the work. He established righteousness. The scepter of righteousness, it's his scepter. He obeyed the law perfectly and suffered unto death for our sins imputed, charged, accounted to him, and he drank damnation dry. Daniel said it. He made an end of sin. He, brought, he finished the transgression. He brought in everlasting righteousness. Uh, Hebrews 2 talks about how the captain of our salvation was made perfect through sufferings. doesn't mean he was made morally perfect because he was always morally perfect. It means he finished the work. Remember there in John 17 when he talked about the authority that the Father would give him, it was based on the fact that he said, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. So understand that. This, this, uh, a lot of people say, well, this isn't Christ because Christ already had the crown. It wasn't given to him. No, this is his mediatorial kingship, lordship, his glory upon the finishing of his work. So here he comes on the white horse. He's coming in righteousness. He's coming in holiness. He's coming in justice. Everything that this world is not, <laughs> this is what he is. This world full of sin. So what is he doing here? Well, he has a bow. That's a weapon. And the crown was given unto him. He has the right. He has the right to do this. He has the authority to do this. He himself is qualified to do this. And then he's given the weapons to do this. And the crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, that's what he's doing. Right now, as we, we sit and as I stand here, that's what Christ is doing in this last stage. He's conquering. Right now, he's in that process of conquering. That's what this first seal is all about. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us this. It tells us that we don't operate as believers, as sinners saved by grace, as true children of God, as citizens of the kingdom, we don't operate like the world. We don't judge or assess or evaluate things as we look around and see them. Because how many times have we seen in Scripture in different passages, you know, we, when we look around, when you read the newspaper, or you go on the Internet, or watch the, uh, the evening news, it looks like this world's being turned upside down. It looks like it's, it's a chaos, anarchy, you might say. Every man's done, doing that which is right in his own eyes, you know. And we all talk about that, especially uh, growing up the way we did in America in the 50s and, and, and around that time in the 60s. You know, I mean, we had it pretty good, you know, providentially. You know, our, our life was, you, some, I, I think just about all of you remember, our life was father knows best, that kind of thing. But it's not like that now, is it? <laughs> Things have gotten worse even in our little corner of the world. I always tell people, I say, now look, you know, this isn't the center of the universe here now. I mean, that life was always bad in other parts of the world. We just didn't know a lot about it. But life's gotten worse. And we think, well, man, this thing, you know, what's going on? Christ is still in the process of going forth to conquer and conquering. Now, how's he doing that, this conquering? Well, we know that he conquers his people in the preaching of the gospel. And I think that's one of the main issues here. When, when God the Holy Spirit, under the providence of the King of Kings, brought me and you under the preaching of the gospel. That's the arrow, the gospel, you might say. And by his power gave us life in the new birth and brought us to see his glory, to see our sinfulness and his glory and bring us to faith in Christ and repentance of dead works and idolatry. What was, he, what, what was that? He conquered us. He's doing that. So here's the first thing about this conqueror is that out of all this, and, and you look, think about this now, because we all, we, you know, we're all disappointed. You know, we say, well, we wish there were more who believed the gospel, and we do. 
And we're told to go out and preach the gospel everywhere. Everywhere we have an opportunity. I'm going to preach on that in the 11 o'clock hour. On the mystery of the preaching of the gospel. Do you know the preaching of the gospel is a mystery? But he's going to uncover the mystery for us. And so here's what we need to be assured of. Even though there's few of us, few people who really believe the true gospel, Christ is still bringing his people into the kingdom. He's still conquering. He's still, the gospel's still there. It's still being preached. You might not have a stadium full of people, but God is still finding his elect people. Christ is still bringing his sheep into the kingdom, and he does that by conquering us. Because what are we by nature? We're enemies of God. We're rebels. And so in essence, that's the conquering. What does he do? The Holy Spirit in the new birth gives us a new heart, doesn't he? A new spirit. New knowledge. And what does he do? He makes us willing in the day of his power to come to Christ and to submit to his righteousness as that which alone saves us, justifies us, and brings us to God. That's a conquering. So he's going forth to conquer with that bow shooting the arrows of his gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what happens in that process, it is the savor of life unto life to his people. But he's conquering in another way too. Not only is it the savor of life unto life, as Paul wrote, to his people, his sheep, it's the savor of death unto death to some. And he's conquering them. He's still in control. And that conquering will not be finished until the end time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, he brings his people to that under the preaching of the gospel for their salvation. But the enemies of God at the end will be forced to bow in damnation. And so there's the conqueror, going forth to conquer. And I love that analogy. I, I think about this, that gospel preaching. And the power of the Holy Spirit is like a bow with arrows shooting right to the heart. We preach, preach to the hearts of God's people. And again, this when we talk about the white again, what does the gospel reveal? It's the revelation of the righteousness of God. So here he is, the conqueror going forth to conquer. And that's the first seal. And the the significance of that seal to us as his people is that look. No matter what we see going on in this life and in the, uh, the general rebellion of the world, uh, no matter what uh, the other religions do, the Muslims or whatever, Christ is still in control. He's on this white horse. He's got his bow and his arrows. He's conquering. And it's all going to end up his way. He's the victor. And his victory is assured. There's no, there's no possibility that he can be defeated in any one instance. Satan can't defeat him. Satan's already really conquered. I know God is still allowing Satan to do his, do his business here on earth among some. But the prince of this world is being cast out. Christ talked about that in his cross work. He's cast out. And that's one of the things that, that the Holy Spirit brings us to when he convicts us of, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Our sins were already judged on the cross. Christ was condemned in our stead. He was made sin. Liter sin was literally, you know, people today are talking about, well, sin's got to be literally transferred to him. Well, it was by a divine act of imputation. And he went under the, the wrath of God for us. But he... Didn't stay dead, did he? <laughs> he conquered death. So Satan's already conquered. The world, you know, he said, I, he told his disciples, he said, I've overcome the world. Here he is right here. He's overcoming. So trust in him. Now look at verse 3. Verses 3 and 4 gives us to the, brings us to the second seal. Here's the second seal. It says, when he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, the second living creature, say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Now here's the white horse, and here's the red horse. You, you've heard this, you know, the first, the first four seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, they, you, you, there's a lot of mythology around all that. But just take it as it is in the scripture. Here's the red horse. 
And it says, And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So there's the red horse. And what does the red horse symbolize? Well, he tells us. It has to do with war. Has to do with conflict. Has to do with death and slaughter. That's what it has to do with. There's the sword. And it's coming throughout this age. Now people say, well, there's going to be wars and rumors of war. Have you all studied history? Have you? Any at all? Sure. When has there ever been a time since the fall of man that there hadn't been wars and rumors of wars? Never. It's always been that way. One of the things that Christ told his disciples when he was speaking of the last age in Matthew 24, and I think it's Mark 13, and I can't remember what the passage is in Luke, is that he wants them to understand, look, the Messiah has come, Christ has come, he has done, he's, he, he's, he's going to, as he's speaking to the disciples now, he's about to do his great work of redemption, he's in control, but he wants them to understand that, look, now things are going to be going along just like they always have been going on. It's not going to change. The fact that Christ died on the cross and redeemed us from our sins and established the, that righteousness for us, it's not going to change this world as far as, as the uh, workings of Satan and the workings of, of evil men and women. It's going to go on like it always has gone on. But he says, and, he, and I believe that's some of the essence of what he's talking about here in this red horse. There's going to be wars. And somebody says, well, it's going to get worse and worse. Well, maybe so. That's, uh, it might do that. You know, we, we hear about it today, don't we? You know, we, you look at the, the, the uh, Arab countries, the Muslim countries, they're all the time talking about war against the United States. They call us the great Satan and all of that. You, uh, North Korea, they're threatening war, you know. And they have nuclear weapons. So, I mean, all that, you know, we hear about that every day, don't we? some shape, form, or fashion. So it's there. Well, it's always been that way. But here, uh, here he's talking about how throughout this age it will continue. And I believe one of the other things that is really being taught here is not only wars and slaughters and, and uh, uh, killings, uh, like war between nations or, war or uh, conflicts between individuals or groups, religious groups or whatever, I believe he's also talking about the persecution of the true people of God throughout this last age. I believe that's part of this red horse. This, this great sword that was given him, you, know, you remember Christ in the, the book of Matthew, he made the statement, he said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. You know, when I was an unbeliever, and my, one of my goals in, uh, in dealing with religious people who called themselves Christian, one of my goals was to prove the Bible wrong. I wanted to prove it wrong. And I would look for contradictions. And one of the contradictions that I would bring up was that right there. I think it's in Matthew chapter 10. You know, when the birth of Christ was, was coming about, the angel came to the shepherds and said, Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And you, you know even the King James Version uh, really didn't get that translation right. You, you know what that means. It's peace on earth uh, among men of, of whom God is pleased with. That's the essence is what it's saying. Of course, nobody, God is not pleased with anybody outside of Christ. I mean, if you're not standing before God dressed in the righteousness of Christ, having him... God's not pleased with you. you that's, that's a biblical precedent that is set forth right after the fall of man back in Genesis chapter 3. But anyway, he said, peace on earth. Well, there hasn't been peace on earth, but yes, there has. Peace between God and his people. And that's what he's talking about in Luke. But I used to bring up that verse in Matthew 10 where Christ said, I didn't come to 
bring peace, but a sword. He said a man's enemies will be those of his own family, his own earthly family. I'll set a mother against her daughter and father against son. You see, what is he talking about? He's talking about the gospel. That when, a, when God brings a person to see the glory of the person and work of Christ, that sets him apart from, from his earthly family who, who, who are unbelievers. That puts them in conflict. That doesn't bring them together. That, set, that sets them apart. And then you have the persecution. He's going to mention this uh, later on here in chapter 6 about martyrs. You know, Christ told his disciples in John chapter 15, he said, now you're going to go out into the world and preach. The world's going to hate you. The world's going to be in conflict with you. Now, why is that? Because you tell the truth. <laughs> and the last thing that the world wants to hear is the truth. They want to hear religious lies. That'll make them feel good about themselves. And even the old atheist Karl Marx recognized that. He said, religion's the opiate of the world. It's like taking opium. It's not good for you, but it makes you feel good. And that's the way false works free will religion is. It's, it's not good for anybody, but it makes them feel good. So that when we come forth preaching the light of the gospel, what happens? Men love darkness and hate the light because what are we saying? Now, you think about this. Think about us when we first come to hear. The, I mean, when I first heard the gospel with the physical ear and, and I understood what the man was really saying, I didn't like it at all because it wasn't telling me what I thought was right. It wasn't telling me what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear that, you know, Bill, you've been a good guy all, most of your life. You, you did this. You got baptized. You joined the church. You're all right. I didn't know anything about the truth. All I knew is I've just... I was on the cradle row, and I guess I got up from there, you know. But I didn't like it because we hate the light because our deeds are evil. And so the persecution comes. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when men persecute you, say all manner of evil against you, abuse you. Now that's part of what this seal is revealing. That look, even when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake, that we're still protected, preserved, and secure in the grace of God in Christ. Here he is still conquering. Even in that, he's still going forth to conquer. So think about that. There's wars, there's conflict, and it's always going to be that way. Somebody said, well, we want to pray for peace on earth. Well, I, you know, I, I would love to see peace on earth, but I do not believe it's going to happen. I gotta, you know, I'm not just being pessimistic there. Because it's gonna go for it's gonna go on like it always has. All right. Look at verse five. Here's the third one. We'll conclude today with this one. The third seal. He said, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. Third living creature, the third messenger. And I beheld and lo a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. You know what that is. That's a scale. Verse 6, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, granted, this, this one may be a little more difficult to get to the specifics of, but I believe the general application is this. This black horse symbolizes, uh, as most, most would say, and I agree, economic hardship, famine, famine throughout the world. Uh, it sort of, sort of indicates, you know, that there will be a lack of things that we need. I believe the main thrust of this is, is this, that throughout the world in the last days there will be a great spiritual famine. Now, I'm not disregarding the physical aspects of what's going on, of famine, uh, uh, economic hardship. I'm not disregarding that. That's part of it. But I believe the Lord in his sovereign providence uses things like that to, 
to put a reflection on the condition of men and women spiritually. I really believe that. And there will be a great spiritual famine. Now, physical famine is bad. People going hungry. People going through economic hardship. That's bad. But God's in control still. He's still conquering. And the people of God are safe and secure. So physical famine, physical hardship is bad. But let me tell you something. Spiritual famine, spiritual hardship is even worse. Isn't it? Remember back in the book of Amos? There was a famine in the land. And what was he talking about? He wasn't talking about wheat and corn and things like that. He was talking about a famine of the word of God. Today is marked that way. We hear a lot of people reading Bibles. We see a lot of preachers preaching to thousands of people. But here's what you've got to ask. Are they preaching the word of God? Are they preaching the gospel of God's grace in Christ? Are they preaching righteousness in him or righteousness in man? There's a spiritual famine. And notice here... And, and, I, and understand now, what he's showing is that the people of God are going to be safe and secure even amongst this, whether it's the physical famine or the spiritual famine. But notice the pair of balances. Now, in the Bible, scales signify what? Equity, justice. That's what scales mean, the scales of justice. I've got some, uh, a couple of cita uh, uh, references there for you. We know, for example, that we don't have to fear this black horse with the scales of justice because our salvation and security is based on God's justice, isn't it? <laughs> when, whenever, whenever we are measured by the scales of God's justice, what are we, came, we come out equitable because why? Because we have Christ. That's right. If we come to God with our works and efforts, what will we hear him say? Depart from me, you that work in equity, iniquity. I never knew you. But we have a righteousness that answers the demands of God's law and justice. We, we equal out to the measure of God's standard. Why? Because we're so good? No. has nothing to do with that. Why? Because we have Christ. He is our equity. He is our justice. He is our righteousness. In Christ, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Mercy and justice have come together. God is just to justify us. And so anytime I see scales in the scripture, I think about that. These balances. But also these balances show that during times of economic hardship, for example... And during times of, of famine, that things just are not equal, not just, especially with the poor and the downtrodden. But he's showing that the Lord's going to make all things equal. In the end, everything is going to equal out to justice. And it will either be in the damnation of those who are found without Christ or in the final glory of those who are found in Christ. Now, he says a measure of wheat or a penny. That word penny there signifies, it's, uh, I think it's a denarius, literally. What that would represent is what would be a day's wage in that time. That would be a day's wage. And what he's saying is that, that a measure of wheat, three measures of barley, you know, they use that to make bread. The... the, the uh, Symbol there is that, that that's what it take that that's what it would take for a person to live physically. This is this is just enough. You see, this is this is the bare minimum. You, the bare necessities. Now none of us would would rejoice at the prospect of just having the bare necessities, would we? So that's how hard it's going to get. In the last days it says. It doesn't say that everybody is going to end up this way. But that's the way, that's the way it's going to be in general across the world. But here's the thing about it is. When, 
when we see this in spiritual terms, and I'm not spiritualizing the Scripture. I'm just taking these things as, they, as they are symbolized in Scripture. Whenever we have Christ, we know we have more than enough. But here's the point. He's all we need. He's the bread of life. Anything less than him falls short. It's death. So we could talk about how in Christ we have more than enough, you know. Uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Uh, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have an inheritance that's in a treasure. But the point is, is, is this, that it may come to a point that where the general population of the world physically may have to exist on the bare necessities. It may come to that. I don't know, to be honest with you, and I'm not going to try to speculate on that. But I know in the spiritual realm, that every true believer has everything he or she needs in Christ. He's all we need. He's just enough. He's even more. But he is the bread of life. And when it says, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. You know what that literally means? If you translate it literally, it means don't do any injustice to the oil and wine. And there are different interpretations of that. As I put in your lesson here, some people believe that this refers to the remaining availability of the most expensive luxuries of the rich. And so what he's doing is show, saying there, well, the world's going to get in such a bad shape that, that the general population of people, especially the poor and the downtrodden, they'll have to live off the bare existence, but the rich, they'll still be abundant in the, in the luxuries of this world. And if that's, if that's the case, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2. It's part of that strong delusion that they would believe a lie. You know, in the parable of the sower and the seed, he talks about those who the love of, of, of the world, the love of riches, chokes out the word. And so that may be a, a good interpretation of this. But you know, in the Bible, oil and wine is normally a symbol of what? The Holy Spirit and the gospel. And I believe that's really what the main lesson here is. In other words, he's showing that as we're going through all these hardships in the last days, the Holy Spirit is still at work in power applying the gospel to the people of God, feeding them with the bread of life. And that is a condemnation to the world. That is a hardship on the world. That's why it's a, it's a, a black horse. So that which, that which is a condemnation to the world, in essence, is a, is a salvation for God's people. So when you look at these things, you can see some physical applications to that, and it's okay. And I don't know how all that's going to work out in its specifics. Nobody does. And don't let anybody tell you they do. But look at the spiritual lessons that come from that. And as I said, that's not spiritualizing scripture. That's just taking, you know, like I said, you know, oil and wine. Wh what is it in the scripture? That's the Holy Spirit and the gospel and the joy and the peace that he gives through the preaching of the gospel. Okay.